uh, now I'll uh, introduce the panel today. Joining me from Right Scale is Yuri Budnick, the director of our ISV partner program. Uh, also with us, Corey Isaacson, the CEO and founder of Code Futures and database scaling expert. And finally, we have David Blinder, uh, the CEO of Family Builder, which is a company who used DB Shards to successfully scale to become a top Facebook app. Uh, we will be answering your questions during the webinar today, so please feel free to use the chat window to ask those. Um, doing Q&A for us is Jason Antibelli, uh, an inside sales rep here at RightScale. And any questions we don't get to during the presentation we'll cover in the live Q&A immediately following. Okay, to give you a quick preview of what we'll be covering today, uh, we'll start with a brief introduction to RightScale and Code Futures. Uh, we'll cover some common database scaling issues and how DB Shards can address them. And after that, we'll show you a demonstration of DB Shards and finally dive into some best practices for scaling services in the cloud. And we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A as well. So with that, I would like to turn the microphone over to Yuri, who will begin by introducing RightScale. Thank you very much, Brett. Uh, from the poll questions that we just did a moment ago, I noticed that there was about 9% of the people that don't know much about cloud computing. I just want to point out first that we're just going to be focusing on database scaling and sharding, but if you want to learn more about cloud computing in general, we have a library of webinars where we've covered that particular topic before at rightscale.com slash webinars, as in plural with an S at the end, and you can find information about that there. Right now, I'm going to talk about, about RightScale, but I'm assuming that most people are familiar with uh, infrastructure as a service and, and cloud computing in general. In, in having said that, let me explain that RightScale is software to manage your clouds. I'll, I'll begin by just giving you a, a sense of the size and scope that we are operating at. Uh, we're a software as a service company ourselves that's been around for just over four years. And we are really used to make it easier and faster to deploy cloud computing environments. And that is really exemplified by the fact that we are usually part of the larger, more complex environments in the cloud today because we make it that much easier to be able to do the ongoing management thereof. So if you go to our homepage, ricehill.com, you can see that we've launched over 2.7 million servers, a light counter there that you can see. So this is actually running at a pretty big scale already. In fact, on any given day, more than 100 million people touch RightScale managed servers every day, meaning lots of our customers have lots and lots of servers who are using RightScale to manage them. Lots of people are touching those applications. And the, the reason they use their software is to either Cut, the, cut down the amount of time it takes to build and deploy an application in the cloud because we have a lot of pre-configured components. That means that you're not building things from scratch. To automate a lot of the things that you would be doing on an ongoing basis when you're maintaining an environment. So things like being able to automate the process whereby your application servers scale based on load so that you don't have to have a lot of idle machines sitting just in case you need them. We can actually react with uh, rules and trigger points that you can set and customize. And also to do things related to managing the environment like uh, having a user permissioning system. That means that you can have different people in your team with different level of access to your environments. So RightScale, as you can see in this diagram, really sits at this intersection of the applications you want to run in and the resource pools, the infrastructure as a service providers that you want to use to be able to run those environments. Hold on one second, I'm forwarding to the next slide here. Sometimes people talk about the cloud as a way to save money and, and it's true that you can do that. It very much depends on exactly what your application is and also architecture questions. But what you can surely do every time it's improve agility, meaning time to market. Can you uh, cut down the number of weeks and months it takes to have something up and going uh, in, a, in a public facing website? I was talking to, I don't know that I have permission to repeat the name of the company, but I was talking to the CEO of a large media company 
who cut down the time to deploy their website by 60 days and added another million dollars worth of revenue from the savings in time. So that's something that we put a lot of attention to. How do we give you tools and components that make it easier to deploy environments without you having to recreate the, the wheel each time? Uh, this other concept that is a, that's a very strong value proposition here is the idea of having choice and being able to deploy to multiple clouds like Amazon and Rackspace and others. Not a big topic of the presentation today, but it's something that I know lots of companies are interested in. Interested in being able to perhaps deploy in one provider today, but have their options open to then move to a second to a second infrastructure service provider later on if the pricing changes or their options and the requirements change over time. And then this other idea of really seeing how you're using the cloud throughout your company. It's often the case, especially in larger companies, that many different employees will individually open, for example, Amazon accounts. In a big company, it's not rare. We found from conversations that there'll be 30, 50 different Amazon accounts, for example, with no central oversight of who's doing what. So we provide this ability to consolidate all that so that an IT organization can give different people the flexibility to access the resources they want, but still have this ability to have uh, the overall oversight of who's using what and what it represents in terms of cost. And also, as I said a moment ago, having a user permissioning system where you can give different people different levels of access. Everything in right scale, or most things anyway, revolve around this idea of server templates. And server templates are different than virtual machines on AMIs, Amazon machine instances. The concept of virtualizing a server and bundling everything into a big file, a VM, has existed for quite a while. And it's quite useful. You can clone those as many times as you want. Uh, you can stand up virtual servers based on those big server definitions. But they're really identical servers in every way. And it turns out that even though that is useful, you actually need to change servers a little bit very often. You don't want an exact copy in every way. So back from the beginning of RightScale or, or CTO developed this idea of server templates that are modular that you can make modifications to. And when it comes to a server definition, a good example is the difference between a CD that you can clone as many times as you want, but you're going to make an exact copy of all those songs and the order that those songs are going to play in, and a playlist in iTunes being a server template where you can change the order of the songs. You can drop a song, add a song. Server templates are modular and very flexible. So for example, a server template for Apache, you can quickly just add a write script to do some additional work and monitoring as it boots up without having to stand up a new machine, do a lot of configuration work by SSHing into it, bundling into a new server, putting it in the catalog and having just one more item to worry about. And in fact, this flexibility that we see with the server templates allows us to do some really useful things that you'll be hearing about in the webinar next. We have in the, in the multi-cloud marketplace today two separate write scripts, write scripts being components of server templates that Code Futures has made available that make it possible to simply add this, this, either one of these two write scripts that you are seeing on your screen to an application server and to capture all that SQL traffic between an application server and a database so that you can get some better understanding of the different SQL queries that you have and analyze whether it's shard ready or not. And in fact, you will be hearing more about this from Corey in a moment. They have a very generous offer where for people that want to analyze their database, they're happy to review the information from them and, and give them an insight into what they might want to do if they want to pursue this approach of showing the database so they can continue to scale it. So with that, I would like to now pass the presentation to Corey Isaacson from Code Futures that's going to tell you more about database sharding. So Corey, please take it away. Thanks, Yuri. Uh, again, my name is Corey Isaacson. I'm the CEO of Code Futures, and I'm going to be walking you through our uh, presentation today. Uh, about database sharding and scalability, and uh, also about our technology DB shards. So um, one thing uh, we want to stress is that um, we, our company is leader, a leader in database scalability and performance. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, it's all based on real-world experience uh, with dozens of cloud-based applications. 
Uh, all of the founders of the company had a lot of database experience before we actually started this venture with DB Starts. Um, we've actually had uh, customers in production for years now, and so we're very, very happy about that with our technology. And we span a lot of different types of applications. We have social networking, gaming, data collection, mobile analytics, uh, really quite a number of different uh, fields that we've actually applied charting to, and it's been, uh, it's been very, very effective technique. Uh, our object objective today is very simple. We want to provide you with useful experience that you can apply to scaling and managing your own database here, um, especially for high volume applications. And of course, we're going to show you an overview of DB Sharks technology also, but I really hope that you uh, can come away with something that you can start to use right away just from what we covered today. So there's a lot of challenges in cloud computing. Uh, I know that many of you are um, newer at cloud computing, and it's good to kind of understand some of these things uh, going in. I know uh, a lot of you have been using cloud computing, and I'm sure you will have seen what I'm talking about to be the case. Um, it's very attractive, as Yuri said, because cloud computing provides a highly attractive service environment. It's flexible, scales up and down. You don't need a dedicated IT staff or at least a large one. Um, it's a pay-as-you-go model. That's all really, really good, and it's incredibly effective. That. We've used it with many, many customers. Um, we also use uh, the cloud ourselves for a lot of different things, including developing and testing our own product. Um, but cloud services occasionally fail. This is what's a little bit less known. Is it's not really the same as having a physical data center, and you really have to be able to plan for that and be able to get used to that. Um, we have seen some network outages, sometimes server failures, once in a while just volume issues, and sometimes the failures are very, very serious, um, as you've uh, probably read about a couple of months ago, we've seen some, some pretty big failures that actually occur. And just across our customer base, we see actually a, a cloud service failure probably about once a week because the database tier is so stressful that we actually are, I think, more prone to seeing that type of thing than, than other types of uh, uh, components of the application. So you really do have to be prepared for that. The other thing to consider is that cloud-based resources are very constrained. You have less CPU available, um, not so much memory in most cases as well. But I.O. rates are much, much uh, different in the cloud, the characteristics of them. Uh, they are slower than what you'd see in a normal data center, but also they can vary uh, over time. They're not necessarily totally consistent. So I just want to walk through what a typical application architecture is and talk about how we would apply scalability to uh, each of these layers. Uh, so typically, um, today's online applications have a load balancer at the front end. Uh, the load balancer essentially takes in requests it balances those requests across a number of application servers. That's what the AS stands for, so that's your app server tier. And then we have the database tier, which is typically done in the master-slave uh, architecture. And the application servers talk to the database, of course, get the information and report it back through the load balancer. So when you talk about scaling in the cloud, scaling load balancers is very, very easy to do. Uh, why? Because uh, load balancers are completely stateless. All they do is take in a request and decide on a round-robin basis or some other mechanism to route it to an app server. Uh, you can have redundant load balancers if you need to. And if one goes down, it's really not that big of a deal. You can just go over to another. Uh, scaling your application servers is, is easy also. It's uh, very, very similar. Uh, generally, application servers today are stateless. Um, you can even uh, manage sessions um, and then have them, you know, if there's some sort of failure, a user would just have to log back in and they get another session again. It's really not too big of a deal. Um, and you can add or remove servers as needed. And again, if one goes down, uh, no problem. But when we talk about scaling the database tier, it's anything but easy. Uh, scaling the database tier is a very, very difficult challenge. And why? Because databases are stateful by definition. That's what a database does. It's preserving all of the information. Um, you have large integrated data sets, um, tens of gigabytes to terabytes or more. We have customers in the terabyte plus range. Um, when you have a big database like that, it's not like you can just move it or recover it in a short amount of time or do anything to it, actually. Um, it can take quite a bit of time to actually, uh, to get, actually get that uh, to happen. Databases are also highly I.O. dependent. Um, they're adversely affected by any service failures, of course, but also Again, the reduced I.O. speeds that we see in the cloud really makes it a much, much different challenge in the cloud. Now, it's a great environment to run your databases, but again, you have to be able to plan for this if you want to scale. And of course, lastly, if one of your database servers goes down, uh, ouch, that can be a huge outage in your application. Um, there are many, many famous stories about this. I don't have to go into those, but you definitely want to be prepared for, uh, for any kind of failure so you can have continuous 24 by 7 operation. And most of our uh, customers are 24 by 7. They have to stay up all the time, and that's a, that's a critical component as well. 
So what we really see is that databases form the last mile of true application scalability. Uh, we really recommend that you start with simple optimizations to your existing database strategy, but then you need to implement a, a follow-on scalability strategy for long-term performance goals. Um, you also have to ensure your databases can fail over, not just for unplanned outages, which everybody's worried about, but also for maintenance. Uh, databases, as they get bigger, take longer and longer to maintain, and it's very, very difficult. As a matter of fact, we're going to be talking uh, with David Blinder of uh, Family Builder shortly, and one of the things that they really were experiencing in their application is that they couldn't do any maintenance, probably for about two years before we started working with them, because it's just too uh, time-consuming to do, and so they had to keep up all the time, and, and really a very difficult situation. So our, our advice is the best time to plan your database scalability strategy is now. Uh, don't wait till it's a huge, uh, till it's a huge fire and an emergency. Uh, very often we do get called at that point, and that's okay. We can help you for sure, but it's much, much better if you start to plan early. So I want to introduce uh, David Blinder. He's the CTO of Family Builder. Uh, Family Builder is uh, one of the very first uh, Facebook applications. David was there from the very beginning. He understands uh, how this environment works uh, incredibly well. Um, and uh, they had some very, very interesting challenges. I'll explain one of those challenges first, and then I'll turn it over to David so he can give you a little bit more detail. But basically, there's, a, there's an old adage that comes back from the mainframe days, which is that all CPUs wait at exactly the same speed. And uh, this is very, very true. And when databases get big, one of the things that happens is you have the CPUs uh, be very unproductive, and it starts waiting just for I.O., because the I.O. can't keep up with the type of queries and the type of inserts or writes that you're doing for that particular database. So this is an actual uh, right scale monitoring graph that, uh, that actually shows what Family Builder looked like before they implemented database sharding. And as you can see, all of the red is I.O. wait, which means the CPUs are just sitting there waiting for this. And the blue, which is very, very small, is the only productive CPU that was actually occurring. So, uh, so David, I'd like you to just uh, tell us a little bit about what your experience was like before you started doing sharding, and uh, uh, if you can share that with, that with us, that'd be great. David, are you there? David, you might be on mute. Yeah, David, I think you need to unmute. You got to love the presentation gremlins when uh, when they get you. <laughs> oh. Well, I'll tell you what. I actually, uh, I'm pretty familiar with David's story. So, David, if you don't mind, I'll cover some of them. And then uh, if you do uh, resolve the problem, you can just let me know, all right? So uh, what we know is that when we, uh, when we first started with Family Builder, David told me an interesting story, which was that when they first started the application with uh, Facebook, they were one of, like I said, the very first 500 applications that ever get started. Um, one of the things they had happen was they actually uh, deployed their application. They did a little bit about advertising. The very, very first day, they got 25,000 uh, people to sign up for the application. It's basically a family tree type application. You can invite your family members. And what occurred uh, right away was that the database uh, couldn't keep up with the load and the application crashed. So David uh, ran to his marketing team and told them, uh, please don't do any more marketing because we need to fix this and we need to get going and get everything stable before we can actually uh, implement this stably. And so uh, they said, no problem, we'll hold off for, for a little while. So the next day, David came into work and 40,000 people signed up. And uh, he, of course, proceeded to run over back to the marketing people and say, I told you, Please don't do any more marketing. And they said, we didn't. And it was just the social uh, viral nature of Facebook applications. Um, and of course, it was growing all by itself and it was out of control. And so when David started uh, looking at doing database sharding, I know that uh, we had a lot of conversations about this before he decided to use our technology. And one of the concerns he had was that he really knew that every time they would do marketing or anything like that in a big way, I had a database at that time of over 23 million users. If they would market to all those users at once and say, hey, there's a new feature, or go and invite your family, what would happen was that so many people would respond that they would actually, uh, uh, again, crash the database, and you'd see a graph like this. You'd have to shut things down and limit it. So they actually were limping along and 
just limiting the marketing activities, and they really couldn't grow as fast as they needed to. And so that was really what drove the decision to look at uh, database sharding. And uh, one of the things that uh, I think helped um, pick our technology is that we made it very, very easy, and they didn't have to rewrite their application or change their whole environment or a new type of database. And they were running with MySQL. They still run with MySQL today. And so all of their uh, base application code continued to work in the sharding environment. So, uh, David, hopefully I did that justice for, uh, for uh, your part of the, the, the story there. So we've done a lot of research as to why this type of slowdown occurs. And unfortunately, databases don't slow down in a very gradual or predictable way. When they do slow down, it looks like a hockey stick like this. This is an actual NODB load curve. Um, what we did is we were actually with a fairly large table with a lot of indexes. We were able to load uh, about a gigabyte in one minute, about three and a half gigabytes in about 12 minutes. And 39 gigs took 10 days and actually never finished and we finally gave up. And we know what the reason for this is, is that as databases get larger, you get more and more contention on the disk, and in particular, the indexes get more and more complex. And that's really what drives this type of hockey stick slowdown, and it's really kind of the worst nightmare for any application architecture or DBA. And we know that these challenges apply to all types of databases. Of course, we see this in traditional database systems like MySQL and PostgreSQL, Oracle, uh, DB2, those kinds of databases. They're all I.O. bound. Um, they're basically uh, based on transactionality, write ahead logs. They have lot contention. Um, it's hard to keep them up with high availability. Um, Lifecycle management is a big challenge, doing backup and restore, restore any type of database maintenance, those kinds of things. But even with the newer types of databases with no SQL, we're seeing those database technologies add more and more of the features that the typical and traditional relational databases have. And so as you start to add indexes and as you start to do more different types of queries, um, you're finding that you're running into the same type of slowdown and issues there. So really, no matter what type of technology, the truth is that big databases are very, very hard to manage. Um, elastic scaling is a real challenge. Um, and degradation from growth in size and volume is, is virtual certainty. You will see it if your database keeps growing. And if you have a very successful application that starts to grow really fast, you're going to see uh, you know, big problems probably faster than you want to see them. So a sound database design is very, very key. You need to have the architecture set up, and you need to balance all the different factors so that you really can deliver the way that you need it to. So based on all this experience, we came up with a, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but true enough, what we call laws of databases, which is small databases are really, really fast. Big ones are really, really slow. And so you want to keep the database small. That's the model of the story, and that's what, uh, that's what database sharding and scalability is all about. So the answer is, of course, database sharding. That's what our company does. That's what our product and technology does. And it doesn't really matter what type of database technology you're using. Anybody who is helping you to scale your database is using database sharding. And I'm going to explain exactly what database sharding is so you can have a better understanding of it. So from uh, Wikipedia, you can see this is the definition that they give. And basically, it's a scheme for horizontally partitioning database data where rows are spread across different servers in different physical databases. And so if you look at a very simple picture of this, you can see that we have four shards set up. Each one has its own database. Let's say that that's a MySQL engine on each different server. And what we've done is we've taken, let's say, customer information and sharded that by customer ID across the different servers. So you can see we spread it out by customer ID um, using that particular key. So we have a simpler definition that we like to use, which is when you're doing database sharding, what you're doing is you're taking a really big monolithic database, you're breaking it up into a lot of smaller databases across many servers, and then they're using a key value to actually spread that data across. Um, if you're curious about where the term sharding comes from, uh, it's, it's basically refers to like broken glass. And I believe that Google coined the term uh, originally, and so uh, it's been around for a long time. But basically, you're taking, again, this big database and breaking it up. So the key to database sharding, and the most important thing to consider when you put your database sharding architecture together, is you must have a shared nothing architecture. Um, there are a lot of different approaches to this. But what we know is that anytime you have any centralized components, uh, any computer science paper that you read about scalability will tell you that you're limiting your scalability if you have actual shared components in your environment. So what you want is a shared nothing cluster where the database shards are actually completely separate and don't have any shared components whatsoever. 
So let's look at the uh, DBSARTS architecture, which is our specific approach to this problem. Uh, we have a pretty unique approach. We're the only company that does it this way. Um, we have, again, the same tiers that you're used to. We have the application server tier uh, at the top. Then we have all of our database shard servers at the bottom. You can see in this particular example, again, we're showing four shards. And the way we do it is we actually provide a plug compatible uh, set of database drivers. So we have database drivers that look just like the MySQL driver or look just like uh, a Java JDBC driver. And we have other drivers as well. And basically, you plug those drivers in, and the driver has all of the intelligence and knows um, where all the information is across the shard and environment. Why is this important? Because it's our driver technology that allows database sharding to be totally seamless to your application. You essentially just work with um, the normal type of SQL uh, that you're used to. You don't have to do anything special at all to do that. Then what happens is when you actually run a query or something like that, the driver knows which shard to go to. There's also nothing between you and your database. So when you're doing a SQL statement, it's actually routed directly to the database engine. So it's a MySQL or Postgres, whatever you're using and the results come back, so there's no middle tier or anything like that in our architecture. Um, and then we also have, on the server side, we have a DBSharts agent that manages things like replication and failover, um, high availability that we have also as an option, um, and it also does some things on the parallel uh, operation side, which we'll explain as well. It, so it, again, it's a very, yes? Well, this is Joey speaking, so just as a point of clarification, that means that if I'm using DBSharts, I don't need to change the logic in my application servers to be aware of the fact that data is now stored across multiple in different database servers. So all that complexity is not something I need to deal with, right? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. It's, it's just basically you keep your application just the way it is. Let's say you're using PHP and you have SQL in your PHP application. Our driver basically intercepts that SQL, interprets it, and decides what to do with it, and you keep exactly the same code. Okay, great. That's exactly correct. So how well does database sharding work? Uh, well, one of the hardest things and biggest challenges in any database, particularly traditional relational databases, is write speeds. Um, this is a graph that we did from a benchmark we put together on EC2. And essentially, you can see we were scaling from one to four shards. These are our shards at the bottom of the chart here. And we were scaling from about 2,500 inserts per second all the way up to 10,000 inserts per second. And so you can see that we get virtually linear scalability. Um, we do see some variation in the cloud because sometimes resources are busier or you know, more free and things like that. But basically, you get pretty much linear scalability, um, especially on writes, which is very, very important. Reads scale very, very well, too. That's a much easier problem to scale. Um, and in fact, in some cases, with our parallel query capabilities, we can even see better than linear uh, read capability as well, scalability. So why does database sharding work? Um, it's a very simple principle. It's because we're really maximizing the CPU and memory per database instance. By making the database size smaller, we're actually giving more CPU and memory available to the database instance itself. What really happens, too, in practice is that the size of the index trees get much, much smaller. And that really can be an order of magnitude uh, easier for the index computation. This is why consistent writes can happen with the sharded environment much, much better because those index trees are much smaller and the computation work that has to happen when you're inserting a new record is much, much less. Our reads are faster too, of course, with smaller indexes, and you can do things like aggregates and list, list queries. Those are much, uh, generally much, much faster. And that's because we really are spreading the load and doing that in parallel across multiple servers. And we'll show you how that works. So there's also no contention between servers. Um, they're locking in disk and memory and CPU. Every server has its own database management system running on it. So again, its own instance of MySQL. So each one has its own access to all of its own capabilities there. Um, database sharding also allows for intelligent parallel processing. Um, sometimes you need to do things across shards. Um, we'll show you how that works uh, shortly. And basically, uh, that's something we lovingly call Go Fish queries across shards. And that's our name for uh, parallel processing or parallel queries. But the goal is to keep the CPUs busy and productive. That's really what we're that's really what we're after. So, uh, uh, David, I'd like to turn it over to you again. I don't know if you were able to resolve your difficulties. You're able to do it now or no? I believe I have. Yes, I believe I have. Okay. Everyone can hear me. Great. So, so David, here you go. Here's the before graph, and 
So what, what this before graph really represents is a traditional master-slave uh, configured MySQL supporting uh, four uh, active, uh, four active uh, application servers uh, behind two uh, load balancers. It's like a standard setup over there, right scale. And uh, the problem we ran into was just simply that um, our, our application, which is family tree, uh, uh, which uh, is family tree, requires like a, a fairly, I wouldn't call it sophisticated data model, but it does require a lot of database to run, where we're, you know, going in making family tree queries a lot based on the user's profiles. Another thing we do is we allow the users to make a subset of their friends list, which we call our family list. Now, this gets kind of large, because believe it or not, there's a lot of people in the social space on Facebook that uh, have their family within their friends. And this became, you know, this and the other, the other uh, user-based data became so large that, uh, you know, we tried to carve in some, some of our own sharding. Uh, we tried to write it ourselves. And it was really kind of a patchwork, and it really was not ideal. But the sharded solution provided by Code Futures, and again, I'm, I'm telling you this not because I'm a salesman for them, but because it was extremely valuable to me. Uh, was, I would say, as near transparent as one could possibly get to the de development side of the app. So that uh, their driver through uh, PHP uh, through, on the LAMP stack actually drove the queries to the correct uh, MySQL server, uh, which, you know, in, in looking at this like 100, you know, 100 feet above, these are separated MySQL servers, and the driver is routing, uh, routing the calls to the appropriate shard key uh, that you set up. And again, if if it seems complicated now, it's it's actually quite straightforward, and that's one of the reasons why I selected the solution. Great, David. Thanks a lot. And uh, as you can see here, you can see the end of the, uh, you know, what it looks like today. Um, Family Builder is running with DB shards, and they're running just on four shards. Uh, we had kind of hoped David would need more shards by now. He's been running with us for a long, long time. He was actually one of our very first customers. And, um, uh, but it's actually totally handling this volume, and uh, they're able to do as much marketing now as they want uh, without any issues whatsoever. I mean, actually, today, uh, Family Builder is actually a top 50 Facebook application. They sign up over 100,000 new users every single day. Uh, they doubled the number of users in the last 12 months with no issues, again, with score charts, uh, to now over 40 million. So I want to go into uh, a little bit now of how you actually implement the sharding process um, and how we actually put this together. Uh, we have pioneered a concept of code features called relational sharding. And what that does is basically we take a relational database and we look at your exact database and we determine the best way to shard your particular structure. Um, this is why we do this is because we really can optimize and make things easy and convenient. We can also preserve the relational nature of your database this way. This is a very, very important principle. And the way that it works is we basically group tables into what we call shard trees. Um, here what we have is a customer shard tree where the customer is the root of the shard tree. Um, and then it has children of customer order and order item. And basically, any single customer will have one customer row, many customer orders, and many order items. They'll all be in the same chart. That will work uh, just fine. So we then have global tables, because we want to preserve the complete relational nature of your database. And so the global tables are replicated to all charts. So I just want to talk quickly about how relational structuring actually works. Um, basically, what we do is we have, again, from our client driver and the application server, you put a SQL statement through, it makes a decision about what shard it should go into. Um, that SQL statement is directed to the database on that particular shard. We bring the results set back. The same thing happens for write SQL statements. So we basically have cred queries, which is create, update, and delete. So any type of those type of statements, we actually examine the SQL and look at it and automatically route it to the correct shard. So again, it's very seamless, like David told you. Um, you don't have to uh, you know, rewrite your application or anything like that. You don't have to learn a new API, none of those issues. 
So I just want to give you some quick examples of how relational sharding works in practice. Uh, basically, what we do is, again, we recognize the shard key in the SQL. So if you look at a simple statement like select star from customer, we have customer ID equals, let's say, one, two, three, four. We can determine from that customer ID which shard that customer is in and direct the query automatically. That's why it's totally seamless. We also could do an insert the same way. We look at that particular key, and an update, of course, works, works exactly the same way. So these are what we call sharded queries because they go to a specific shard in which your goal in database sharding is to have as much of those as possible, um, but you can't have everything work that way. So there is a technique for cross shard results sets, and we talked about this earlier. It's called go fish, and this is where we have to do parallel queries. And this is really, really good for uh, aggregates or sorts because you can't possibly guarantee for a given application that you're going to be able to do everything with single shards. So what we do is we basically take uh, the client driver, it recognizes that it's a GoFish query and has to go across multiple shards. It delegates that to our DB Shards agent on the server side. That agent broadcasts the SQL to all of the other uh, shard servers. They each run the SQL in parallel, which is very, very fast because remember we're dealing with much, much smaller databases. We bring back the result sets and then put it back to the client so it all looks like a single query. So everything looks to you just like a single database, just like it does today. That's exactly the goal. And one thing we know from working with Family Builder and other customers is that we really expected GoFish queries to be a very uh, you know, seldom used thing um, for reporting and things like that. But we actually found that there were quite a few use cases that needed to support it. And so we actually see that it's very common. And we have customers typically doing between 5 and 20% of their actual production SQL with GoFish, but no problem. It's actually very, very good in production. So how do we do a cross shard result set? So here's an example go fish query. I'm basically doing a group by um, uh, from the customer table based on country ID and getting a count of customers based on that. And so that's a very, very easy uh, go fish query. And basically, again, that's broadcast to all of the shards and it works totally seamless. So let's talk about what it takes to actually move uh, your database to database sharding when you're using DB shards. Um, there are three basic steps in moving to database sharding. Again, it doesn't really matter what technology you're using. Each of these three steps are important. Um, the first one is analyze. So you need to look at your actual um, infrastructure in your database and decide what the best approach is and what your sharding strategy is going to be. The second is you need to be able to shard your database, especially if you're starting with an existing database. Um, a lot of people are building new applications, but not all of us can afford that. And if you have an application that's got years of work into it, the last thing you want to do is have to start from scratch. So sharding is where we actually take your existing database and can run it through our tools to actually move it to a sharded environment. And then the last step, of course, is you have to be able to manage your database um, and operate it uh, in, in real time and keep it going. And what we have is a lot of tools there for helping with that um, that actually feed back into the analysis process. So as you grow, you're going to be probably adding more shards. Um, you may be adding new tables, doing different kinds of things, and that's where it feeds back into the analyze process again. So it's a very circular uh, type of process. And so DB Shards has tools in each of these three areas. Um, one category we call DB Shards Analyze. That's for all of the analysis. Um, and we have uh, a big portion of that we're going to make available, as Yuri said, it's available now as write, write, temp, write skill templates so that you can actually download, download those and use them at no charge. And we'll explain how that works in just a minute. We have our DB Shards DSL tools, which stands for Dump, Shard, and Load. This is where you actually can take your existing database, dump it, shard it, and load it. And then we have DB Shards Manage, which helps you monitor and manage the whole environment. We'll show you a little bit of that, too. So let's look at the DB Shards Analyze process. Um, this is a uh, uh, process that we use very, very successfully with our customers. Um, the first thing we want to do is we want to have you review your database schema, and from that, you can define what your initial sharding strategy is. Uh, very often you're going to shard by something like user, but different databases and different applications need a different approach. Um, then what we do is we give you our uh, no-charge DB Shards Analyze driver. We have a plug compatible driver for all sorts of different uh, environments. And what that does is that you run that in a test environment, and that logs all of the application SQL that you have. From that, we can run that through our DB Shards Analyze reports with your data model looking at your shard strategy and your SQL logs, and from that we can actually tell you that your application is shard safe or if there are any things that you need to consider, especially for optimization opportunities. There might be some things that you're doing that won't be as efficient as other things, and you can generally implement those right away or you can implement those over time. It really just depends on your approach. 
So I'm going to show you just a little bit of um, what the DB Shards Analyze reports. Bring this up real quick here. So um, for a DB Shards Analyze report, again, we take the SQL log that you give us, and we take your data model, and we take your sharding strategy, and we run it through our DB Shards Analyze report generator, and it automatically kicks out a report that looks like this. What it shows us is it shows us every unique SQL statement that you have in your application. We can see how many times it was run in that particular test run that you did. Um, and from that, we can actually tell exactly what DBSharge is going to do. So in this case, for instance, you can see that the shard action is shard right. So whenever we see green, that's great because that means it's going to go to a single shard um, uh, server and run uh, as fast as possible. So that's, that's the optimum situation. If we have writes to our global tables. If you remember, the global tables are replicated to all shards. Those show up in blue. Um, they're still very efficient, but you don't want to do as many global writes as you would uh, sharded writes. That's for sure. Um, you, know, you would want to have those be less frequent. Now, global tables can still be pretty large, but you don't want to have them be changing you know, thousands of times a second. If we go down to um, uh, something like an update, here's a good example of something that we detected a shard safe violation. And what this means is if you look at this update, this is updating, trying to update customers, setting the last name for every single customer where it belongs to a specific country. So it's probably a SQL error anyway, and something you wouldn't want to do is change everybody's last name to Smith in the US. That would be not so good. Uh, but in addition, you can also see that we can't determine exactly which shard to go to. So this is a shard safe violation. And what it means is you have to either give us a hint to tell us exactly what you want us to do, or you have to give some sort of correction. And this is very, very important to uh, keep in mind because um, we have very, very good detection and prevention of what we call uh, shard safety violations. And that's a very, very important uh, shard in the bar that makes it much easier to manage. And then lastly, if we go down and look at some other, we have um, orange ones, which are go fish. Um, again, those can be fine for a production environment, but at least we want to show you what those go fish queries are so that you can deal with them and uh, use them or address them in another way. Hey, Corey, so if I wanted to be able to get all this information about how my database and my application behave, all I got to do is install your script that, that you have in the Rice library, and then you can just capture all that information as my application is running on doing its day-to-day -day work, right? That's right. That's right. You just run your application as normal. Our drivers are all plug compatible, so they're totally seamless. You send us your logs, you send us your database schema, and uh, one of our consultants will work with you to actually help you uh, determine uh, how your application is going to work in a scalable and sharded environment. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll give you the exact instructions for where to get those things shortly. Okay. Great. So I want to show you a little bit more of uh, DB Shards in action. Uh, we have a demo running here. I'm just going to switch to that real quickly. So what we have is we have a few different sharded environments running right now. These are actual live environments running with, uh, we, come, we ship DB shards with a bookstore example. And so this is our bookstore demo. These are real transactions. Um, we're basically running about 60% writes, about 40% reads in this particular benchmark we put together. And what you can see here is this is a two shard deployment, DB shards benchmark two. And what we have here is you can see the range of SQL statements that we're ranging around 9, 10,000, sometimes a little bit more um, inserts and SQL statements per second. So you can actually see how many we're doing. You can see that we're doing, um, here's the number of sharded writes that we're actually doing, which are the, the biggest volume that we have here. Um, and then you can see how many global reads we're doing as well. So again, it's working out pretty well. If we look and compare that to a four shard environment, um, you can see that we're running right around 20,000, which is just about twice as much. Again, you do see some variation here because cloud environment resources are, uh, you know, can be variable. But basically what you're seeing is you're seeing linear scalability, um, the exact same picture. And then lastly, if we look at 16 shards, you can see that this is scaling all the way up to between 70 and 80,000 SQL statements a second. Um, so you can see that it's uh, almost exactly four times faster than the four shard environment and eight times faster than the two. So you can see that as we keep adding shards, uh, you can basically keep ramping the number of uh, uh, servers that are, are helping with it and everything works out just fine. So Great. Co Corey, in, in this case what you're showing us is more than outstripping the storage capacity of any given server. It's about overcoming that I.O. limitation of a single box and being able to 
essentially multiplex across many different nodes of a database to have a lot more capacity, right? That's correct. That's correct. As a matter of fact, if you take our 16 uh, shard rate that we're running out here, 70 or 80,000, and you divide that by 16, that's what a single MySQL instance by itself will be able to do. So we're really just taking the speed of MySQL. We, by the way, can work with any database engine, so we really have built-in uh, database agnostic support because everything we do is outside the database, so we don't have a database engine ourselves. And so really, whatever the speed of that particular database engine is, it just scales to that degree as you have more servers. It's exactly correct. So I just want to briefly touch on our uh, no charge shard analysis. Let me bring back up my slides here. Um, for this analysis, basically what we will do is um, you can download our analyze drivers. Like I said, we have for native MySQL, JDBC, and ODBC. Uh, these are available as right scale templates. If you search for code features as the publisher in the multi-cloud marketplace, you'll find them. One is called the login driver for native MySQL. The other one is called DBShard's analyze driver for JDBC. You run this driver in your environment. It's very, very easy. It installs automatically, and you just have to configure your app server to use our driver instead of the normal one. And then our DBShard's consultant will walk you through the whole analysis process. And you'll find out exactly what it takes to shard your database regardless of the technology you select. So uh, just a quick wrap-up on database sharding is really the tool for scaling your database. Uh, DBSharge is a complete drop-in sharding solution. Again, we have plug compatible drivers. Nothing is between you and your database. We have intelligent agents for shard management. Uh, we're database agnostic. You can use the database that you like today. You don't have to pick, uh, pick one that you know, maybe you have to switch to or something, anything like that. Uh, it works great for existing applications, and of course, it's easy to do with new ones too. And we provide an entire support infrastructure for the entire sharding process. Plus, we have 24 by 7 monitoring and support for all customers. So, uh, Brett, if we want to turn it over to questions and answers, we can start to answer some of those. So, Corey, let, let me start by grabbing one to give you time to review. There's lots of questions coming in. And uh, that way you have a moment to see what's there. And you can uh, pick them in the order you want to you wanna answer them. But by, by the way, Corey, while I answer this question, you might want to, when you have time, switch to your web browser and go to the right scale library to show people the scripts and where they are, if that's something that you can do easily. So with that, let me answer the, the first question I have here, and then, uh, and then I'll send more your way, Corey. The question is, do the server, do the server templates in right scale replace the need for Puppet or Chef or other configuration management tools? It's more of a widening the choices that you have. You can use server templates in right scale, uh, and we've had that technology for quite a while. You can also use Chef as a configuration tool in right scale if that's your choice, or you can also use Puppet. So what we strive to do is to not make it an either or situation, but instead uh, present you with different options so that you can choose the best tool for the best job. So we're really not limiting you there. Um, and Corey, are you ready to answer a question, or should I give you more time and answer some more on my side? Yes, I am answered, Ray. I, um, I saw one question come in, which is, um, is sharding constrained in some way by the table count in the database? And the answer is no. Um, whatever your database engine can support, you can have as many tables as you like, just like you do today. So Yuri, do you see other questions that uh, you'd like us to address? Yeah, you know, I gotta say, by and large, the questions are about sharding, Corey. I mean, I can take a stab at some of these, but they're much better for you. Let me answer one partially because I think it's sort of directed at both of us, and then then I'll let you take it from there. The question is, uh, do we have a master slave set up for Microsoft SQL 2008? So that's sort of a. I'm gonna assume they're asking if we have that plus if it's shardable. The way the question is asked, so as insofar as the right SQL part, yes, we have Microsoft SQL. And, and you can set it up so that uh, so that it's doing the proper backups, and you can have a slave server for it. And, and uh, you can contact anybody at Right Skill that can answer more specific questions there. Uh, I'm going to assume that person wanted to know about sharding of a Microsoft SQL database course. Maybe you can speak to that as well. Great, great. Yeah, we are coming out with support for um, SQL Server soon. Actually, we have some early customers using that now as well. So, uh, but again, because we're database agnostic, it really doesn't matter that much to us. Our drivers will work with any of the technologies. Yeah, and since you just uh, mentioned that, Corey, let, let me read a question that I have here that maybe you can answer. 
which is, is there anything like the SQL logging and analysis for other databases besides uh, MySQL that you mentioned? Yes, yes, the logging will actually work for any database. Um, we have a JDC support and a JDBC template today that's out, um, but we actually have uh, next week we will be publishing one for ODBC as well, so you can use native MySQL, ODBC, or JDBC, and that will work for every single database. So you can, you can get our logging to work for any database regardless of what you have. Uh, would you like to take uh, the next question then, Corey? I think you have just a lot sure. more than, than I do. Sure, absolutely. Um, one is somebody's asking uh, what's the difference between uh, database partitioning and sharding? That's a very, very good question actually. Um, you certainly can take large tables and you can partition them. Most, most database engines today, um, uh, including MySQL, support that. And so you can take a large database table and actually shard it or partition it across multiple disk volumes. Um, the issue you still run into is that if you have to do large queries or large writes on that, the indexes are still um, can be constrained, and also you still are very constrained by what a single CPU and memory uh, capability can do. So you will hit limits on that that just can't be overcome. So when you do sharding, you get rid of that limit because each different shard server has its own independent disks. You think of it that way, and so there are no limits there. And you're also adding memory and CPU as well as adding disk capacity. Whereas with database partitioning, you're only adding disk capacity. So, uh, so that's a very, very good question. Um, and somebody asked why there aren't any shard reads showing up in our, our demonstration today. Um, this benchmark, we actually tried to do the hardest things with the benchmark. Um, because we really like to test our product with the most stress possible. And so we did all global reads and we did um, uh, shard writes, and the shard writes is really the thing that's, uh, again, typically the biggest bottleneck with customer applications that we see. Um, and somebody's also, also asking about in-memory databases. That's a very good question. Is, will we be competitive with this technology? We actually see that DB shards will be able to work with in-memory technology as well. And there are some new things on the horizon that I can't mention today, but if somebody wants to contact us individually, I'd be happy to cover that. But it's a very exciting uh, future direction for us. And we really, uh, we really have some very uh, uh, good plans in that area, and we think that that eventually is going to be a very, very strong capability for, for DB Sharks. Again, we're database agnostic, so we really can work with any type of relational structure. Hey, Corey, I, I, I have a question here. I want, I want to answer if, uh, if I can jump in. I, have, I, I think this is a good question in terms of clarification. I have somebody asking, so what, what exactly do you get and how does it work? So let, let me just spell that out again because... It, again, it's, I think it's useful to clarify it. There's the scripts that we describe that anybody in Writescale can launch. In fact, you don't even need to be a, a paying customer of Writescale. They, they run in the free version of Writescale as well. That allows you to analyze your database queries as Corey described. And they very, uh, uh, as a promotion, I've agreed to help people uh, interpret the data from their analysis. So that's somebody that anybody can do and can do for free. They don't even need to be paying Writescale customers, as I just said. And for the people that actually want to use DB Shards technology, that's where, and, and Corey can obviously speak better to this, but that's when they work with you one-on-one. -on -one. They have assets in Writescale where they make the software available for you and your environment to be able to uh, implement it into your database and they actually help you to get that going properly. Maybe you can explain that a little better than I can, Corey. Yes, yes, that's totally correct. Um, when you become, when someone is a DB Shards customer, it's basically a subscription uh, license, and what that really covers is all of the support that we give you. And so basically it's a flat fee per, per month, uh, per server. Uh, generally we have two servers per shard, so if you have four, star, four servers, you're running eight, or, I'm sorry, four shards, you're running eight servers. Um, and so basically you pay a flat monthly fee for that. That includes 24 by seven monitoring and support. Um, very, very often, uh, if there is some sort of issue with Amazon or something else in the cloud, but we basically find out about it generally before our customers even know about it, and very often it's uh, addressed right away. Um, you know, plus, we have all of our failover technology as well. Hey, Corey, actually, I just got a couple questions that, that sort of dovetail into what you were saying. One of them is what monitoring services do you provide? And I'm, I'm going to actually assume they mean that more for you than for us. And, and the second question is, so what is the... What does the support include? Maybe you can discuss both of those things together. Great, great. Well, our monitoring services, essentially at DB Shards, it's all self-monitoring, and it kicks out alerts to our support team as well as our customers. So anytime anything happens, uh, even if something 
you know, sometimes, for instance, databases get full and the, we start running out of this, this space, anything like that, we actually detect those alerts and actually send them out. Um, and our uh, 24 by 7 support team uh, responds to those. So we basically can address any of those questions. Um, we have customers all over the world that actually do that. And again, that's included with every customer. So we really end up being, uh, I think, to some degree, an extension of your own organization. We, we often end up taking a lot of the database administration uh, work over for the sharded environment and we make it very, very easy for customers to do that. So we really try and make it um, as economical as possible for you to be able to do that. And do you also react if a machine goes down, a, a cloud server somehow disappears? You, you bet, you bet. And we have, uh, we have had the experience of seeing that more than once, I will tell you. And uh, we actually uh, can handle the whole thing again, generally, before customers even know that it's occurred. Right. Yeah, I think, uh, I think David would be a good uh, uh, person to talk to about this at some point, but, uh, you know, really, I think our customers like our support very, very much. I think that's a big part of what our offering really is. So there is a question, Yuri, about um, if you have four shards, you know, what's the procedure to back them up? That's a very, very good question. Uh, basically, we have uh, uh, automatic uh, backup strategy that we actually implement for customers. You can decide on how you want to do your backups and what schedules you want, but basically in the cloud what we're doing is we do uh, full snapshots once a day, and then we can do uh, partial snapshots of our transaction logs uh, very, very frequently if you want to. We have some customers who do it every 15 minutes. Um, generally, you know, every single write in DB shards is guaranteed because we're writing it across uh, two servers um, on an automatic basis. And so generally, we don't lose any transactions at all. And really, the backups are just there in case something, you know, some sort of disaster really, really does happen when we really can't recover from them. But generally, uh, generally, it just operates just fine, and the backups are there just as extra insurance. Hey, Corey, I, I got a question here, but it's for you, but I'd just like to read it because I think it's relevant to what you were saying. You're actually saying for, for, for Dave, uh, from, you know, because of the family builder experience, but I, I suppose either one of you guys can tackle this, and it's the question is, what happens if one shard crashes? We are left with three shards, and all the data of the crash shard is gone. I, you know, I, I know the answer to this one, Corey, but once again, I know you can answer it better. I, I'd like Great. to actually well, I know. admit. Yes, go ahead, David. Oh, um, I want to reference on, on this topic, the uh, disaster at Amazon on April 21st, which uh, many of you, if, uh, you run. Foursquare or Quora are very aware of. If you run Family Builders, Family Tree, you're also aware of. And uh, while we saw a lot of people going down, we were very fortunate because our shard strategy was uh, something that actually kept us up. Um, we did lose uh, like one unit or something in, in, in the zone affected, but we had the shard. The shards were still up. Uh, and we were able to actually uh, serve during that time. Um, I think I think one of them went down, but three of them were up. So we were still delivering select at the time, which you know gave the impression that we were up, which was very comforting. Um, but uh, at the time, I think uh, inserts were not working. The point I'm making, though, is uh, we look better than everybody else. Great, David. Thanks a lot. You know, Corey. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who is uh, who's been listening. We have reached our our hour, but uh, we're happy to go over to answer some questions because we still have quite a few people on the line. Um, for those who can't stay, please email us your questions, and we'll respond to you via email um, after this. But we're going to go ahead and continue answering questions from here. And uh, for those who have to drop off, thank you for your time. And uh, Yuri, you can go ahead and, and keep answering them. Thank you, Brent. I actually I have another question right here in my hand that that sort of dovetails with what you were just discussing. And let me read that. Could you also please identify the impact to high availability designs for this sharding approach? And if I can embellish the question a little bit, I think they probably meant running the database across different Amazon regions. We've been using that as an, an example quite a bit. And what does that mean for sharding? Yes, great. Well, one of the things that we, the very, very first thing that we looked at when we looked at uh, database sharding architecture when we first started on this project uh, and company about four years ago, is what we said is that we knew that we were adding failure points. Um, uh, 
we, we also know that in the cloud that's even more true, right? As, as you're adding charting, you're adding failure points. So what you need to do is you have to have a strategy to be able to fail over, as David was talking about. And so with DB Sharks, we run two servers generally for every single chart, and that's how we keep um, the reliability in place. Um, we are looking at doing disaster recovery also. Customers have asked us about this, so where we can actually go to different regions or even different clouds using the right scale multi-cloud support. And so that is something that if someone's interested, we'd be happy to take that question online and tell you what our plans are there. So essentially it's almost like a master slave for each shard they're calling, right? That's correct. No. That's correct. That's correct. And with our replication technology, we can do all sorts of interesting things for disaster recovery, multi-site, all of those things. Yeah, so high availability is right up your alley. It was the very first, uh, frankly, that was harder to solve than almost anything else we did in the product. Yeah. That was, that was actually the biggest challenge that we had. Hey, so, Corey, I, I get what I think it's a really simple question for you here. Can you analyze directly from my SQLD.log from, from that file? Uh, we don't have support for that now, but we could build that if we wanted to. Um, really, it's very, very easy to use our logging driver. Um, it's so easy to install and plug in. You can just it's plug compatible with what you have now. And basically, it just logs some other things that we get from the client side, that, like transaction transactionality and other things like that that we don't get from MySQL. Plus, most of our customers don't want to turn MySQL logging on because it really slows things down too much. So this way, we're just impacting the performance of one application server rather than the whole, than the whole uh, production environment. Yeah, and I would just like to remind people on the call that it, it's really a matter of looking up the right script, uh, adding it to your server template, template that you have for your app server, clicking the little blue button that, that starts it, and that's it. You're capturing the data that you, then you can share with the folks at Code Futures and then allies it for you. So it's, it's, it's very straightforward, in fact. Yes, and I might add that, you know, we've, we've obviously built a lot into our client-side technology. Um, that's a big strength of ours. And one of the things we do is a lot of our statistics, we do have server-side statistics also, but what we found is that if we can get statistics out of the drivers from the application server level, we can get a much, much better feel for actually what's happening from the application point of view, and there's a lot of tricks and things we can do there that you just can't do in the Yes, yeah, so I mean, you're, you're not just providing the software, it's the software plus your expertise in terms of what's the best running strategy for any given schema or, or particular business uh, approach or, or business problem they're trying to solve. It's not just the software, it's that that's, plus the know how. That's totally correct. That's totally correct. With, the, with the, the large number of customers that we've looked at and worked with, we basically provide that expertise for every customer that we, we, we uh, operate with. But generally, it's a very, very quick discussion. I don't think we've had a shard strategy discussion that's gone more than 30 minutes um, you know, with a customer. I mean, it's really pretty straightforward. It's almost always obvious what you want to do. And our tools make it very easy to see what the right strategy is. Please go ahead, Corey. The questions are really all for you. Great, great. great. Well, there's another question that we saw is, um, you know, how do you decide when to add another shard or how many shards should you start with? Um, and so we have, a, we have kind of an anecdotal way to do it. We do it more scientifically when we look at the, the logging driver results and other things as well. But basically what we usually ask people is, if you remember when your database last was working really great, that's how big you want each chart. And the reason is that it really does vary quite a bit per application depending on what you're doing. Some applications are very write heavy, some are very read heavy, some are doing lots of aggregation queries, and it really makes quite a difference to do it. Um, but it, it really works out. Um, you know, very, very well. So, so anyway, so um, uh, people are also asking about uh, parallel queries. Um, and so for parallel queries, they are supported with all of the drivers we support. So basically you can use, again, uh, native drivers. You can use um, uh, JVC for Java. You can use a native MySQL. So we support all of those different drivers and you can, uh, you can make it work uh, very, very easily. And another question is, is the DB, is the client um, a lightweight? And the definite, definitely it's very, very lightweight. The client does um, almost nothing. Um, it has a very, very efficient um, parser um, in it, a SQL parser that actually looks at the SQL. And really all it's doing is uh, delegating the work to the native database vendors, um, actual connection. That's really how it works. So 
It's a, it's a very, very lightweight component. Again, it, it operates pretty much just like your standalone driver does, just with a few things uh, added to it. So Yuri, that's about uh, most of the questions that I see here um, that, that uh, seem like they're relevant. So, so thank you, Corey. I would like to uh, remind, we still have quite a few people on, and thank you for staying with us through and through. It's always a good sign when we have this kind of dialogue going. For those of you that are on this call that would like to share the content with other colleagues, we actually record this webinar, and it will be available, if not later today, by tomorrow morning at rightscale.com slash webinars. So you will be able to download a audio, I mean, I'm sorry, the video recording of this. And also, uh, for those of you answering, asking questions online, we'll contact you to give you more complete and deeper, specific uh, answer to your questions. So by all means, uh, thank you for helping with that. And uh, we look forward to those one-on-one -on -one conversations with us, and especially with Code Futures, who are the real experts in starting here. And with that, I would like to bring this webinar to a close and say thank you to our guests and to Dave Binder from Family Builder for volunteering his time as well. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.